From the beginning of 1945, the whole of Japan was within the bombing range of the United States Strategic Air Force, based in the Marianas. As the days and weeks went by, the bombings became increasingly intensified. Not only the coastal waters, but the inland regions and the hindsight of Japan came under the wings of the superfortresses. Hiroshima, a city of 350,000 facing the inland sea, was the largest city in the Chugoku district in western Honshu, the main island of Japan. Here was located the army headquarters for the Chugoku district. Since the time of the Sino-Japanese War of 1894-95, when the Imperial General Headquarters was temporarily established, Hiroshima was an important military base. The port of Ujina, Hiroshima's outport, served as a supply and transport base throughout the war, while the neighboring town of Kure was one of the principal naval bases of Japan. It was the 6th of August. The air raid alarm which had been on from the night before throughout the Chugoku district was lifted for the time being. It was an unusually calm and clear morning. A few minutes after eight o'clock, two super fortresses in formation appeared over the city. Then a bomb came hurtling down from one of the giant bombers. There was a blinding flash, then a deafening explosion. In an instant, Hiroshima was a scene of unprecedented chaos. Hiroshima was instantly transfigured. There was nothing left but ruins, nothing standing to hinder a full view of the city. Every type of transportation was completely wiped out. All institutions and organizations, public and private, were destroyed. Their functions came to a complete standstill. For several days, little information was available. Over the radio from the United States came the announcement that the deadly weapon was the atomic bomb, the first ever used in the world. As the situation quieted down, it became clear how fearful the bomb was, fearful beyond ordinary human imagination. The first casualty report gave the dead as 30,000 and the injured as 86,000. Later it became known that the casualties were actually much larger. Ninety percent of the 75,000 buildings and dwellings in the city were completely destroyed by blast and fire. The total casualties were approximately 194,000. Accurate figures are unknown and difficult to obtain because of the confusion which gripped the city for several days and because several unaccounted army units were stationed there at the time. The scope and extent of the devastation testify more eloquently than anything else to the enormous destructive power of the new bomb. The direction in which the trees fell offered one clue in locating the center of destruction. Hereafter we shall call the center of detonation the epicenter. The epicenter was located south or on the other side as seen from here of the Tori gateway to the Gokoku Shrine. We considered the damaged area to be within 15 kilometers from this point.
This, for instance, is Itsukushima, 15 kilometers from the epicenter, or at the outside limit of the afflicted area. Damage here is confined to broken windows. This is Yano Station, about 10 kilometers from the epicenter. Here, too, the only damages were broken windows. Within a radius of eight kilometers, shattered windows were more widespread. At some places, tiled roofs were also damaged. Generally speaking, at points about five kilometers from the epicenter, sides of objects which faced the blast showed more extensive damage. Damage was greater as we approached closer to the epicenter. Roof tiles were shattered or blown off, and here and there Japanese dwellings leaned over to one side. This is the Hiroshima Meteorological Observatory, situated on a hill at Eba, about four kilometers from the epicenter. Here we found evidence of the powerful atomic blast, especially in the seismograph room. Notice the pieces of broken glass which lodged into the wooden cabinet. As we drew near the epicenter, we saw buildings, their walls blown out and their roofs blown down. Ordinary wooden Japanese houses are supported with pillars, four inch square. Upon these pillars rest wooden trusses and over them are laid roof tiles. These houses were destroyed without a single exception. At some places, fires broke out, causing more carnage. Within a radius of two kilometers, practically all buildings were burned. Of the 75,000 buildings and dwellings destroyed, 80% were lost by fires, which started between a few minutes to an hour after the atomic explosion. Except for their walls, concrete buildings also were completely burned out. Steel frames and structures which would not burn were bent, twisted, or otherwise fell in mangled heaps. This is the Japan Red Cross Hospital, 1500 meters south of the epicenter. 
Here, all the surrounding wooden buildings were burned, but the main building of concrete was saved. The damaged windows indicate the power of the blast. A building of reinforced concrete, one kilometer from the epicenter. A watch dealer's store. This is the Hiroshima Gas Company, about 800 meters from the epicenter. Two-thirds of its east side was destroyed. Upon examination of these reinforced concrete buildings, we found that in many cases, faulty construction also contributed to the extent of the destruction. This is a section of ancient Hiroshima Castle, one kilometer north of the epicenter, where the Imperial General Headquarters was once located. This represents the state of damage caused by blast on wooden Japanese structures. As we drew close to the epicenter, we found that because the blast came from overhead, such perpendicular objects as the Tori Gateway, which is not a strong structure in itself, remained erect on the ground. The concrete Chamber of Commerce building near the epicenter. The damaged parapets indicate that the blast came from over. This is the commercial and industrial exhibits building built of brick, 300 meters from the epicenter. Bridges close to the epicenter attracted the special attention of our survey party. The Aioi Bridge, 300 meters from the epicenter. The entire sidewalk on the north side, which is further removed from the epicenter, slipped out of place by 60 to 120 centimeters. In the case of this bridge, it is believed that this was caused by the reflection of the blast from the surface of the water below. pavement on the west side also slipped out of place. The 
Motoyasu Bridge, 100 meters from the epicenter. The interesting point about this bridge is that the copstones of the lanterns on both sides have jumped out of place in opposite directions. This indicates at a glance that the epicenter lies on a line which runs through the middle of the bridge. rust. This was the color of bombed Hiroshima. sulfur were collected as we toured through the ruins of this devastated city.
sulfur was removed from porcelain insulators on electric poles. These materials prove most useful in studying the characteristics of radioactivity. Measurements were made with a Lauritsen electroscope, which is sensitive to both beta rays and gamma rays. When bones are bombarded by slow neutrons, the phosphorus in them becomes radioactive phosphorus, P32, which emits beta rays with a half value period of 14 days. This curve was reduced to the value of August 6th, the day of the bombing. The ordinate indicates the intensity of beta rays, while the abscissa, the distance from the epicenter. When bombarded by fast neutrons, sulfur emits protons, and like bones, produces radioactive phosphorus, P32. The intensity of the beta ray is indicated on the graph. In this way, we found the distribution of neutrons. To determine the degree of the intensity with which neutrons were distributed in the Earth in the area of the epicenter, measurements were begun in the middle of August proceeding to the north and south from the Tori gateway of the Gokoku Shrine. Measurements to the east and west were begun in September. This graph shows the intensity measurements. At the Gokoku Shrine in August, it was 4.2 times the natural leak. About 1.5 kilometers from the shrine, the intensity in the first part of September was 3.9. For the sake of convenience, calculations were made on the basis of the value of the natural leak in Tokyo. The intensity at the center was about four times the natural leak. And so the physicists announced to the public that at no place in the devastated area did there exist such powerful radioactivity as would be a peril to human life. In October, measurements were continued with the Mayer electrometer, which is sensitive only to gamma rays. Hence, measurements with this instrument were entirely different from those made with the Lauritsen electroscope. The strongest point of intensity was determined with measurements made with the Mayer electrometer. That point was 150 meters south of the Tori gateway of the Gokoku Shrine, and on the south side of the Shima Hospital.
The epicenter was determined according to the intensity of radioactivity. The value was 74.6 J. J indicates the intensity at which one eon pair is made in a single second in one cubic centimeter of air under normal temperature and pressure. Our interest was also drawn to the effect of the meteorological condition at the time of the bombing. This was studied at the observatory four kilometers from the epicenter. The day was clear. A slight breeze came from the southwest. However, the pressure tube anemometer stopped recording. The average time was about 8.15 a.m. The recordings of the sunshine recorder were also interrupted at approximately the same time and showed that clouds had appeared, indicating the time of the detonation. Thirty minutes after 8.15 a.m., ashes rained in torrents northwest of the city in such places as Fukushima-cho, Koi, and Takasu. Clothes of refugees were stained black by the ashes. Lumps of ashes blown by the blast stuck on wooden shutters. This area was measured with the Lauritsen electroscope in September. Although the greatest volume of ashes fell in the vicinity of Koi Station, the intensity of radioactivity was much stronger at Takasu, 1,400 meters west of Koi. Upon measuring the intensity distribution along a line running east and west through the epicenter, it was found that the point of highest intensity was at the entrance to the Ueno Garden. The intensity was 3.6 times as much as the natural leak. <clears throat> the intensity was found to be still stronger in the hills behind the Fukuzoji Temple, slightly north of the Ueno Garden, along the north-south line. In other words, the amount of ashes did not necessarily correspond with the intensity of radioactivity. In their search for radioactive ashes, our physicists collected ashes which fell on roofs and collected in eave troughs and water tanks. Measured with the Lauritsen uh, electroscope, some of these ashes contained radioactivity as strong as 70 times the natural leak. As a result of chemical analysis, it was found that the ashes were a fission product of uranium. What are called ashes contain fractions of strontium and barium. The mass number of strontium being 89 with a half value period of 51 days and that of barium 140 with a half value period of 12 days. The ashes were found to be fission products. Further measurements were made in October and January with an air electrometer. The area of strongest intensity was the hill to the rear of a Takasu, the value being 22J. However, close study of the intensity distribution revealed that activity is weak at the summit of hills and other elevated places, and strong in the canyons. This is because fission products were washed down into the canyons by rain, which fell several times since the bombing. The distribution was thus quite different 
from that at the time of the bombing. We also found radioactivity in ashes as far away as Kure and Hiro, 26 kilometers from the epicenter. It is believed that fission products whirled high up into the sky and drifted with the wind to these distant places. The discovery was also made that radioactivity in the earth did not descend below the value of 7J, however far we went. In Tokyo or Nagasaki, the natural leak was around 5J. To find the answer, measurements were extended to Otake, 28 kilometers to the west. The value here was 10.3J. In other words, wherever we went, the value did not descend below 7J. In this burned out area, objects could be found which were burned in a distinctly different manner from those which were burned by fire. For instance, concrete was discolored to a light reddish tint. Granite was scaled off. The surface of wooden materials were scorched black. A characteristic of these burns was that shadows were left by obstacles. What, we ask, can be conceived from the relative positions of the shadow and the obstacle? For instance, what can we conceive from the shadows on the bridge? By the shadow of this walking man, or by the shadow of such immobile objects as the railing on the bridge? This report of ours, however, was confined to one problem. That was to determine the direction from which the radiation heat came by a study of the relative positions of obstacles and their shadows. For instance, we studied the direction of the radiation by this shadow. We selected obstacles which had shadows on both sides, compared them, and computed the average. Lines were then elongated. By such measurements, we were able to determine the direction at which the bomb detonated. This lookout post is located on top of the Credit Association building near Hiroshima Station. The shadows found here were one of the means of determining the epicenter as well as the angle of the point of detonation. Direction and angle were also measured by means of the shadow on the window frame of this tower atop the Chugoku Electric Supply Building. The epicenter is 727 meters north of this point. Measurement of the angle showed that the point of detonation was about 580 meters above the ground. Shadows caused by intense heat were found on the roof of the Chamber of Commerce building, 200 meters from the epicenter. The direction of the epicenter was also measured by the shadow of the handle on this gas tank. The epicenter is about 2,300 meters to the northwest. In the compound of the Gokoku Shrine, there were many granites with shadows which were suitable for making measurements, both of direction and angle. From this shadow, the epicenter was 350 meters, the point of detonation about 550 meters above the ground. From the data thus gathered, a chart was drawn to determine the epicenter. 
Lines elongated from various points did not necessarily coincide at the center. However, a point within an observational error of 15 meters was determined as the epicenter. This was about 25 meters southeast of the Shima Hospital. The point of detonation was determined as 570 meters plus minus 20 meters above the ground. Because of the phenomena found, the area of the epicenter may be called a fused zone. One such phenomena is the granite, and one reason why it has scaled off so beautifully is that granite is a poor conductor of heat. By magnifying the granite's surface, it can be noted that it has not only scaled off, but the mica has melted. This one is a natural granite. The melting point of mica is 900 degrees centigrade. Hence, in the case of this granite, the heat applied was over 900 degrees. This is the Gokoku Shrine, 350 meters from the epicenter. Pebbles, molten like glass, were also found at this shrine. This wall was 50 meters from the epicenter. On the surface of the andesite on the wall, it appears as if some molten substance has adhered. But magnified, it actually proves to be the effective heat on the andesite itself. The molten condition is similar to that of the pebbles we saw. The entire surface of this tile found at the epicenter has been fused. The heat which fused this tile was about 1,300 degrees. This is the surface of an entirely unaffected tile showing the structure under a prism. Some of the substances shown here were fused like molten glass when sudden heat was applied. Fused tiles found at the epicenter, however, were not all originally the same, as the tiles were made by different manufacturers in different localities, using not altogether the same materials. The manner in which the tiles fused differed the more removed they were from the epicenter, because of the difference in the angle of radiation and declining degree of the heat.
Let us now compare tiles found at different distances from the epicenter. This was found at the epicenter. This one was picked up 300 meters away. This one was found 550 meters from the epicenter. The furthest limit at which tiles fused was about 550 meters. Granites, however, scaled off even at this distance. By magnifying the scaled granites, we found that the mica had melted in some portions and carbonized in others. In some instances, the two phenomena were found together in the same granite. By our survey, we found that the furthest limit at which granite scaled off extended to a point about 900 meters from the epicenter, or much farther than the limit of fused tiles. We shall begin our tour from the outer rim of the city and proceed toward the epicenter in order to see the effects of the atomic bomb on plant life at various distances from the epicenter. Rice fields removed by some six kilometers from the epicenter were burnt out. In those located eight kilometers away, half of the leaves of the rice plants were said to have been burnt. But toward the end of September, when we visited Hiroshima, these plants had already recovered and the fields were turning mellow gold. At points two and three kilometers from the epicenter, there were two hills, Hijiyama and Futabayama. Here the leaves of trees facing the blast were burnt out by heat rays. But at the time we inspected the area, new leaves were beginning to sprout and considerable recovery was noted. Upon close observation, signs were still in evidence of the harm plants had suffered. Leaves which were exposed to the radiation of heat rays were burned from yellow to reddish brown. Parts which were shaded by other leaves were unharmed. burns on the dai dai, or bitter orange. This is three kilometers from the epicenter. The Hiroshima Higher School, three kilometers south of the epicenter, was spared from the fire. But the Hiragi Mokusei, a species of olives growing in the campus, was burned. The leaves in the shade, however, were unaffected. 
You can even see the shadows of the sawtoothed edges printed on the leaves below. The urban district, two kilometers from the epicenter, was completely demolished. But even in this area, signs of new life were observed. We then proceeded to the Gokoku Shrine, located close to the epicenter. The compound of the shrine was untouched by the fires which raged in the city. But due to powerful heat rays, all plant life completely disappeared from the surface. Life which survived in the subsurface, however, was already beginning to grow again. Enokorogusa, or pigeon grass, Mehishiba, or crabgrass. And the Kayatsurigusa, a kind of sedge. No abnormal signs were observed in any of these plants. But the atomic bomb emitted such powerful penetrating rays, such as gamma rays and neutrons, and it is here that we discovered the effects of these rays on plant life. castor bean plant which we found at a point about two kilometers from the epicenter. Those we found in the compound of the Gokoku Shrine had leaves with white or yellowish green variegations and were sometimes also deformed. These leaves are unequally lobed. These show poor development of a part of the leaf. The chlorophyll is lacking and white patches are seen. These are unequally lobed and shriveled. These abnormal plants were seen in an area about one kilometer from the epicenter. But as this area was in the urban section, almost all plants were burnt by fire. Hence the area was not suitable for study as regards the effects of penetrating rays. Our studies also included underground animal life, whose movements are moral. Because our study began rather late, sufficient results could not be obtained but observation of such animal life as we collected showed no abnormalities. The conclusions we have been able to draw are at present under study. summer when the atomic bomb hit the heart of Hiroshima and the people were thinly clad. Many parts of their body were exposed. In fact, quite a large number were semi-nude. First aid stations reported that 80 to 90 percent of the cases handled by them immediately after the bombing were burns. Burns resulting directly from the atomic bomb were caused on the parts of the body which faced the rays. There were no burns on the opposite side. These two soldiers were among 2,000 others who were at the Chioda Public School, 1,800 meters south of the epicenter. The one at the right was wearing long trousers. 
the one at the left a short sleeve blouse and knickers. Burns in these cases were only on the right side as the ray came from the above right front direction. The toes of the fellow in knickers escaped burns because of the protection offered by the slippers he was wearing at the time. This soldier was in his barracks about 900 meters northeast of the epicenter. His posture at the time was somewhat like this, and the ray came from the left rear. He was wearing his uniform, and his hand was bandaged in white, as shown in the picture. The comparatively heavy uniform was charred, but the bandaged hand was unaffected. Color of clothes made quite a difference, and the degree of the burns varied according to the color of dress. This is an example of a pattern of a dress burned onto the skin. The difference in the speed of heat and blast is shown here. This soldier was 1800 meters south of the epicenter. When he saw a flash of light, he immediately fell flat on the ground. Then his cap was blown off by the blast. The cap mark around his head indicates that he was burned by the ray before the blast flew off his cap. Some of the scars show pigmentations in deep purple. On the head, however, depigmentation is seen. Disturbance of function is also caused as a result of burns. Four or five days after the burn, skin was grafted from the right thigh. This is the condition a week later. A case of perichondritis of the ear as a result of burns. The bombing occurred when this fellow was in the military hospital 500 meters from the epicenter. Although he survived miraculously, he suffers from severe deprivation. A case of serotitis caused by burns. This fellow was exposed to the ray about two kilometers from the epicenter, the ray coming from his left front. This girl was at the Toyo steel mills, 1,500 meters west of the epicenter. Her left leg in the region of the knee was pinned under the debris when the building in which she was working collapsed.
This young Red Cross nurse was injured when the Red Cross hospital dormitory was destroyed. A falling pillar caused a compound fracture in the right leg. Another Red Cross nurse, working in the second floor of the hospital, suffered from lacerations caused by flying glass. Other nurses suffered from facial injuries. This fellow was standing three meters from the window of a building one kilometer north of the epicenter, bare from his waist up. From about the tenth day, aneurysma of the right radius artery appeared. This woman was one kilometer east of the epicenter. Although she was not burned, she received lacerations in the region of her left eye and ear. On September 6th, the eyeball had to be removed on account of abscess of vitreous. On September 15th, her leukocytes were 2,500, and on the 20th, 3,500. The prognosis was poor. At the Fukuya department store, there was a sign, Don't Touch, Infected with Contagious Disease. This corresponded to the report that cases of diarrhea accompanying high fever and bloody stool resemble dysentery. This shack on the premises of the communications hospital was built as a ward for infectious diseases on the second day of the bombing because a violent outbreak of diarrhea and vomiting created suspicion of an epidemic. At the end of two weeks, which was the critical period, burns and cuts, which appeared to be curing, suddenly worsened. Hemorrhage developed, which could not be stopped. Many died and the number of deaths kept mounting from day to day. Pure Pura appeared on the upper half of the body in a majority of cases, and as it spread to all parts of the body, the condition of the victim became worse. Depilation was also a characteristic symptom of the critical period. This soldier was in the barracks one kilometer northeast of the epicenter. He suffered no burns, but around the 8th, 28th of September, more than seven weeks after the bombing, depilation developed. Spots appeared, accompanied by a fever of 39.5 degrees and diarrhea. This soldier was about 800 meters north of the epicenter. Leukocytes were 5,000. The main symptom is depilation.
a brother and sister who were upstairs in their house two kilometers southwest of the epicenter. It was reported that after about a week, they began to develop symptoms of depilation, anorexia, gingival bleeding, and fever. Mother and daughter, shown here, were both inside their house, two kilometers southwest of the epicenter. The daughter was injured when an icebox fell on top of her. The mother had no visible injuries and was nursing her daughter outside of the city when a month later she herself became seriously ill. This woman was pinned under her house, 600 meters east of the epicenter. Excoriations are observed around her ears and other places. On October the 3rd, local sites were 1,500. Symptoms, apathic fasius. Her entire family died, leaving her the sole survivor. At army headquarters less than one kilometer north of the epicenter, this fellow suffered a sprain at his loins when the barracks collapsed a case of odomateus apathic fasius with symptoms of anemia. The bone marrow of the upper half of the femur is red, while the bone marrow in the lower half is fatty. The myelocytes are practically disappearing, leaving only plasmacytes. When the condition takes a favorable turn, myelocytes, erythroblasts, macroblasts, and megakaryocytes would reappear. The spleen is generally atrophied, so also are the lymph follicles. When burns are accompanied, the fibrinoid degeneration of lymph follicles is sometimes seen. Lymph nodes swell up in red, while lymphocytes are atrophied when seen through a microscope. The skin shows depilation and ulcer. The ulcer is fringed in dark purple, the central part reaching the corium with the epidermis exfoliating. On the scalp, hair roots and sweat glands are atrophied, causing depilation. The spermatogenesis in the testicles has declined and there are practically no spermatozoans left. Only cylindrical sortolic cells are left. In ovaries, the atrophy of primordial and grass follicles are observed. On the surface of the mucous membrane of the digestion tube, necrotic pseudomembranous inflammation is seen. In the lung, bleeding and edema were often observed, and secondary infection by bacteria developed, making various abscesses large and small. The liver shows muddy swelling when macroscopically seen, while the liver cells are atrophic when viewed microscopically. When burns are combined, serous exudation in the dysis space is observed.
In the kidney, nephrosis muddy swelling was sometimes seen, with the tubulus atrophied here and there. The adrenal gland was atrophied in the critical period. Histologically examined, the cortex was becoming thin and atrophic. In the hypothesis, the colloid, vacuolic degeneration of the basophilic cells, is observed. In the period, follicles varied in size, the epithel being flat. Hiroshima Hospital of the Japan Red Cross, 1,500 meters from the epicenter, was the best hospital in the city. It was completely demolished, save for the three-storied reinforced concrete building. All the installation and equipment were destroyed. Few wards and instruments were found in a usable condition. 114 of the inpatients were injured. Among the hospital staff and nurses under training, 36 were killed and nearly 300 injured leaving only 36 physicians and 120 students in any condition to handle the patients. Though short-handed, they did amazing work amidst the confusion which followed the bombing, fighting the fire and taking care of the 400 cases within the hospital itself and the thousands who rushed here from the outside. Communications Hospital, 1,500 meters northeast of the epicenter, also overflowed with patients. Medical supplies amounting to 100,000 yen were completely exhausted on the fourth day. Out of 12 doctors and pharmacy staff, three were killed and five injured, including the director. Only seven of them, including the injured, were able to work immediately after the disaster, defending the hospital from the spreading flames and treating the injured.
This shack, which was built immediately as an isolation ward because of the fear of possible epidemics, is now used as a temporary autopsy room. Toshiba Public School, two and a half kilometers north of the epicenter, was used as a first aid station. The entire neighborhood was encircled by fire, and everybody was forced to abandon the place temporarily, leaving behind the seriously wounded who could not be removed. As soon as the fire was brought under control, the residents returned to resume their duties, and among the first of them were two physicians, three dentists, two pharmacists, and one midwife whose services were badly needed. The Koi Public School, two and a half kilometers west of the epicenter. Victims who came here were in a horrible condition. Many collapsed when they arrived and died. Doctors and school teachers worked hand in hand to administer treatments and even cook the meals. This grave post was erected in memory of the hundreds who died and were cremated here. Kusatsu Public School, five kilometers southwest of the epicenter. The building was only slightly damaged. Patients were removed from the first aid stations in the western section of the city and concentrated here. Professor Araki of the Kyoto Prefectural Medical College was engaged in autopsy work in this dimly lit warehouse. quarantine station at Ninoshima on Hiroshima Bay, 11 kilometers from the epicenter. A field hospital was immediately established here, and patients who were brought here by boat received first aid treatments and were given Lysol baths. 2,000 patients were brought here on an atomic bomb day alone. Members of the Army Medical Corps worked without a wink for three consecutive days and nights under the supervision of Army surgeons. The hospital attached to the quarantine station, containing 1,000 beds, treated from 3,000 to 9,000 patients daily. The 
tomb post bears the words, tomb of a thousand persons. However, during the first seven days, this quarantine station alone handled more than 1,300 bodies of the dead. make up for various deficiencies, boiled seawater was distilled as a substitute for saline solutions. Even decoctions from persimmon leaves were made where vitamin B was needed. Lack of medical supplies and food generally weakened the physical condition of the inmates. One hospital director told us, people will be discharged from here, but they have no place to go. Our hospital is no longer a hospital, for it's becoming a regular slum. of the island of Kyushu. The port of Nagasaki is a deep inlet connected with the East China Sea. Surrounded by house-covered hills, Nagasaki is, or rather used to be, one of the most picturesque port cities of Japan. Its population at the time of the disaster was 270,000. An old seaport, Nagasaki was also an active industrial city with shipbuilding yards, steel mills, ordnance factories, and electrical manufacturing plants. With the Sebo Naval Base and the Omara Airfield nearby, Nagasaki constituted an important military zone. Nagasaki, if you will recall your history, was the gateway to Japan in medieval times. Through it flowed into Japan the world's civilizations before Japan secluded herself from the outside world for nearly three centuries. Evidences of these old contacts with the outside world were the many temples whose architecture was fashioned after that of old China and the Roman Catholic churches. It is the holy land of Japanese who embraced the Roman Catholic faith 22,000 of whom lived in Nagasaki. Came the deluge three days after the tragedy visited Hiroshima. The date, the 9th of August, 1945. The day was calm, bright, and windless. 
a hot summer sun shone upon the city. Since early morning, an air raid alarm was on in the Nagasaki Sasebo area. Then it was lifted. But for two hours and a half, the alert warning continued to prevail. Then exactly at 11 o'clock, two super fortresses appeared over the city from the northeasterly direction, flying at a high altitude. The first plane dropped three objects attached to parachutes. At 11, two o'clock, the second plane dropped an object, its descent taking about 40 seconds. Then came a blinding flash, followed by an explosion and a blaze. The destruction was the greatest ever wrought by man. The bomb missed the center of the city and detonated above a canyon to the north. Let us now view the general scene of devastation from the top of one of the hills to the east of the city. On the other side of the hills, at the left of the harbor, lies the city. These hills on both sides of the city were the brakes which intercepted the atomic blast and prevented the destruction from extending to the harbor section and the heart of the city. At the right of this narrow pass lies the area of total devastation. All buildings, save those of stout reinforced concrete, were demolished. The whole of this neighborhood, once teemed with wooden houses and small factories, now is flattened out and denuded of everything. Only pebbles and broken tiles remain. The epicenter was slightly to the north of the center of this district. We shall now go to the top of the hill on the other side, the western side, to survey the destroyed area. We first view in the neighborhood of the epicenter, and then the harbor and the urban center. According to deductions made by the physicist group, the point of detonation was about 490 meters above the ground and above the street block number 170 Matsuyamacho. The epicenter is between 30 to 40 meters across the road to the right of the telephone pole in the center of the picture. This pole was there before the bombing and was damaged very little except the second cross piece which was bent down. This indicates that sudden pressure came practically from overhead. The camera will now be turned 360 degrees to view the immediate neighborhood of the epicenter. The epicenter is midway between where we are standing and the elevation in the background. Trees immediately below the point of detonation were not blown down. Though burnt, they remained standing erect. 
Houses within 500 meters of the epicenter were principally of Japanese construction and were completely destroyed by blast and by the fires which were instantly started. Concrete buildings in the same area were partially destroyed but all caught on fire. Most of the human beings and animals were instantly killed. This is a view toward the west. We are now looking southward. And this is a view toward the east. This place on an elevation used to be a residential section. We called it the Hill of Death. It was densely crowded with small wooden houses which were completely destroyed. Only broken tiles and battered pieces of concrete walls remain. This section swarmed with tiny workshops. Only parts of wrecked machine tools were left in the wake of the devastation. Contrary to expectations, many of the steel poles for trolley wires were not blown down in this area. Some were bent in the direction of the blast. But as we proceeded further away from the epicenter, we found them bent or blown flat on the ground. The body of this tram car, made of wood, was completely destroyed by the blast from overhead, but did not catch fire. The same was the case with this one. This one was blown off the rail and completely burned. All the passengers were killed instantly. These rails were twisted when this railway bridge was struck by the blast which came from the right side above. The girder on one side was thrown out of place by more than one meter. penitentiary, 300 meters from the epicenter. The wooden buildings and reinforced concrete walls were destroyed, and over 140 persons, including the inmates, the prison staff, and their families, were instantly killed. heat melted the surface of the tiles. The Shiroyama Primary School, 500 meters from the epicenter. The roadway trees below the school were broken at their base. All the parts of this reinforced concrete building which faced the blast were completely demolished. The interior was burned. The entire building is cracked on the side facing the blast.
parts of the ceiling on the top floor were blown down or blown up. wooden construction within a radius of 1,000 meters from the epicenter were completely demolished and burned, and most of the human beings and animals were killed instantly. Most of the steel poles for trolley wires were bent. Some were broken or blown down. Grass and underbrush on the hills in the area caught fire and burned, while the trees broke or fell down in the direction of the blast. The Chinze Middle School, 550 meters from the epicenter. The top floor of this four-story reinforced concrete building was smashed, while the entire interior of the building was burned. The Keho Middle School. This school building is typical of the large wooden construction. It was completely wrecked, but did not catch fire. The Nagasaki Steel and Arms Works of the Mitsubishi Heavy Industries Company, stretching from north to south for 1,000 meters. The greater part of this plant was crushed in the direction of the blast, and its steel frames were greatly twisted. Some 2,500 workers were in the plant at the time of the bombing, including student workers. 200 of them were instantly killed, while some 480 were seriously injured. Urakami Station, north of the Mitsubishi Steelworks, was built of wood and was completely burned down. Practically everyone here was instantly killed. A signboard facing the epicenter was not burned, but a part of the black lettering was scorched by the heat. Sun no Shrine. The first stone Torii archway was not knocked down, but half of the next one was blown down, 
while the other half remained standing in a precarious position. Extremely powerful pressure was applied for a mere fraction of a moment. This stone lantern has been forced out of its original position at the base. The College of Medicine, the Medical Junior College, the School of Pharmacy, and the hospitals attached to these institutions. One of the smokestacks leaned in the direction of the blast. Another smokestack in the, in the campus was knocked down. Most of the hospital buildings, being of reinforced concrete, escaped collapse, but the interior of many of them were burned. Because most of the hospital patients had been moved to other places previously, casualties were limited to 198 killed and 235 injured. But most of the students, the faculty, and the employed personnel of the three schools, numbering about 730, died on the day of the bombing or the day after. The Urakami Roman Catholic Cathedral, the largest in Nagasaki, 550 meters from the epicenter. Built of brick, this church could not resist the blast and was burned completely. Two Catholic fathers and a dozen or more parishioners attending confession were buried under the debris and killed. Ninety percent of the 14,000 Roman Catholics who had formed a settlement around the cathedral lost their lives. The Yamazato Primary School, 750 meters from the epicenter. This concrete school building was comparatively near the epicenter, but was not damaged seriously. It explains the fact that the extent of destruction also varies according to the design and construction of buildings. The engineering school, a large wooden building, collapsed, but did not catch fire. In the area between 1,000 and 1,500 meters of the epicenter, practically all wooden structures were destroyed by the blast and the fires which followed. The Morimachi plant of the Mitsubishi Ordnance Factory. The greater part of this reinforced concrete structure was destroyed, while arched concrete ceilings supported by many pillars, collapsed for the most part. This gas tank at Ohashimachi was hit by the blast from left side above. It contained such a small quantity of gas that the tank did not invite fire 
and explode. The Ohashi plant of the Mitsubishi Ordnance Factory. A greater part of the plant, which was at right angles to the blast, was destroyed. The various units constituting the plant were mostly built of reinforced concrete, but were mangled and twisted in a mighty heap. Incidentally, the aerial torpedoes used at Pearl Harbor, which marked the first shots of the Pacific War, were manufactured in this very plant. Of the 7,500 regular and student workers who were in this plant on the day of the bombing, 6,200 were killed, injured, or missing. Steel poles for transmission wires on a hill 1,300 meters from the epicenter were completely bent in the direction of the blast. The underbrush on the nearby hills caught fire and started a mountain fire. All wooden buildings in an area 4.7 square kilometers, 2 kilometers from east to west and 3 kilometers from north to south, were also completely destroyed by blast and fire. All wooden buildings in an area 20 square kilometers, four kilometers from east to west and seven kilometers from north to south, were completely destroyed by fire alone. In short, approximately 11,500 houses were lost. The broadcasting station, 2,400 meters from the epicenter, was burned, but there was no damage to the antenna. Most of the wooden buildings of the Nagasaki railway station were burned. The Nakamachi church, built of brick, was burned by fire. The prefectural government office. Parts near the epicenter caught fire instantly, but parts further away caught fire from 10 to 20 minutes later. The brick building of the prefectural office burned down about an hour and a half later, after the flames had spread all over it. This fire then spread to other wooden buildings nearby, and started a general conflagration in the entire neighborhood. Some of the buildings in areas which escaped complete destruction by blast and fire were damaged. Areas which suffered partial destruction extended as far as 15 kilometers from the epicenter. A casual glance at these houses make it seem as if they escaped damage. of the damage varied according to the position of the building and the topography. 
Houses standing on the projected part of this hill suffered more severely than others in the neighborhood. Wooden fences with little resistance were also smashed up. Let us examine a typical wooden house. The window frame has been blown off. The roof tiles are also partly blown off. The ceiling has been wrecked. And sliding windows have been shattered. epicenter. Before we began our studies, the newspapers reported that the bomb dropped on Nagasaki was much more powerful than the bomb dropped on Hiroshima. Now what were the phenomena caused by radiation originating from such a powerful bomb? What kind of shadows were produced? One of the replies was the discoloration of concrete. Medical College Hospital. From the windows facing the northwest, the direction of the epicenter was measured. The angle was measured from the pent roof. Shadows such as this were not found in Hiroshima. Shiroyama Primary School. No matter what building we went to, shadows for purposes of measurements were found in abundance. Yamasato Primary School. The epicenter was 700 meters from here. The epitaph at the Urakami Cathedral. This shadow on the base stone was of great value in measuring the epicenter from the north-east. By drawing elongated lines from these various points, it was determined that the epicenter was south of the penitentiary at a point slightly east of the crossroad at Matsuyama-cho. The observational error in this case was about 20 meters in radius. Now as to the point of detonation. Measurements were made from four points. One point was the Shiroyama Primary School. Another was the Medical College Hospital. Still another was the Mitsubishi Ordnance Plant. 
and the fourth point towards the Mitsubishi Steel and Arms Works. The altitude of the point of detonation averaged 490 meters, plus minus 25 meters. In other words, it was lower by 80 meters than the point of detonation at Hiroshima. Tiles found in the zone of the epicenter indicated that radiation heat was received directly from above. The fused surface of the roof tiles showed several characteristics which could not be found in Hiroshima. For instance, as shown here, the glassy matter on the fused surface flowed downward. The scratch on this tile must have been caused when some object was blown against it by the blast. Countless pieces of stone fragments are seen stuck on the surface. Examination of tiles made of concrete showed that whereas lead paint remained on the surface which was not exposed to the heat, there was no trace of it on the surface which faced the heat. The fused surface when magnified. Asbestic slates have been scaled off. Let us magnify the edges of the scaled and unscaled portions. The scaling was not caused by blasts, but by the effects of heat. The concrete road leading to the penitentiary is about 200 meters from the epicenter. The entire surface of the road has been beautifully fused, a phenomenon which could not be seen in Hiroshima. The same was the case with these concrete blocks. The surface of the wayside stones were also fused. This is the fused portion of the andesite magnified. This is a sandstone, its fused portion magnified. Another example of a fused andesite. Scaling of this kind was found in some of the stones in the embankment of the Shimonokawa River, which flows south of the epicenter. The stream being near the epicenter, stones on both sides show the effects of heat.
Tiles found about 100 meters downstream and 300 meters from the epicenter were scaled in the manner shown here. This tile was 400 meters from the epicenter. This one was 500 meters from the epicenter. This tile was picked up 600 meters from the epicenter at the Urakami Cathedral. Let us magnify it and see how it is fused. It very closely resembles the tiles found at the epicenter in Hiroshima. This is a tile from Hiroshima. This image, made from a species of andesite, is scaled in one part by heat and fused in another. The pillars at the front entrance to the cathedral are made of granite. The mica in the granite melted in the manner shown here. We found evidences of scaling and melting of mica on the granite Tori gateway to the Sanno shrine, as far as 850 meters from the epicenter. Only slight effects of heat were observed on tiles in this 850 meter area. This tile was picked up near the Urakami station, about 1,100 meters from the epicenter. This was about the limit of the effect of heat on tiles. We then proceeded farther away from the epicenter in search of granite and other rocks. Scaling on andesite such as this one was found at the cemetery behind the cathedral 1,200 meters from the epicenter. The blackish spots on the peridotite shown here are ordinarily light yellowish brown, but the heat changed them to a dark reddish color. Granite Tori Gateway to the Fuchi Shrine, 1,750 meters from the epicenter, shows only slight traces of scaling. This was about the furthest limit of scaling.
It is impossible to know what kind of power was brought into play at the epicenter. Trees standing here were split in two, suggesting that the pressure came from above. But this does not indicate the power of the pressure. This is the wall of the penitentiary, 350 meters from the epicenter. Three quarter inch bars inside the concrete were torn by the tension. The power which tore these bars are only a small expression of the enormous power of the blast. of the Urakami Cathedral 600 meters from the epicenter did not simply collapse of itself. Before it collapsed, the entire cornerstone slipped out of position by eight centimeters. At the Mitsubishi Steel and Arms Works, 800 to 1500 meters from the epicenter, all structures which took the blast on their side completely fell over. However, the factor which stood lengthwise to the blast still stands on the ground. Only the iron sheets which were put up around the building were blown off, and the frames were unaffected. The difference between the two buildings is roughly the extent to which the structures could withstand the blast until the iron sheets had been torn off. A simple example indicating the power of the blast was found in this wall at the Yamasato Primary School, 700 meters from the epicenter. 152 centimeters in height, 822 centimeters in length, and 12 centimeters in thickness. This concrete wall jumped over two trees and moved out of place, as shown here. It instantly moved five meters to the rear, 400 centimeters at the left end, 610 centimeters at the center, and 565 centimeters at the right end. In the cemetery in the hills to the rear of the Urakami Cathedral, several tombstones were knocked down. Among them, there was just one left standing on its foundation. This indicates that the blast had approached its maximum limit of effectiveness. This graph shows the measurements of the size of the tombstones and the extent to which they moved out of position. This water tank on the roof of the Mitsubishi Ordnance Plant 1,300 meters from the epicenter, is situated some 30 meters above the ground. It was bent by the blast, and the welded portions were cracked, as seen here. As the epicenter at Nagasaki is surrounded by hills, an examination of them should provide an answer as to the effects of the blast at higher altitudes. The summit of this mountain, Inasa, is 280 meters high, the distance from the epicenter, 2,350 meters.
shacks on the summit collapsed in the manner shown here. Except one shack built after the bombing, all buildings on the summit were blown down. In other words, the blast was no less at this altitude as on the level below. In this vicinity, the only objects spared from the effects of the blast were limited to houses which were protected by hills. The question now arises, to what distance did the effects of the blast extend? We conducted our survey in three directions. At Tagami, six kilometers southeast, the ceilings were blown up and walls were cracked. At Futami, nine and a half kilometers, Ceilings also were blown up and paper sliding doors broken. At Tome, 15 kilometers, paper and glass sliding doors were blown off and broken. At Is Isomichimachi, a few window panes were broken at each house. However, evidence has shown that the blast was diverted by the mountains to a greater extent in this area than in others. It could be seen from the air that immediately after the Earth was hit by sudden heat of tremendous intensity, it was struck by an all-powerful blast which blew past these seemingly unaffected houses and after affecting everything it touched on its way, finally wound up in the sea.
This curve represents the results of measurements made on September 10th. Radioactivity of bones collected at certain distances were examined with the Lauritsen electroscope on a sample of 10 grams each. Activity found in the bones obtained at the epicenter was 4.2 times the natural leak and was three times weaker than that found in Hiroshima. Intensity of radiations coming from the ground was approximately the same as at Hiroshima, but that at Hiroshima was slightly weaker. The value at the epicenter was 4.3 times the natural leak, while the limit of radioactivity was found to be about 800 meters from the center. Measurements of radiations for ground were also made with the Nair electrometer in December 1945 and January 1946. From the results, we were able to see the general trend of distribution. Calculations were made in the manner described to determine the epicenter. The, de the determination was made also with the Nair electrometer, after a rough determination had already been made by Dr. Shinohara and his party. Dr. Shinohara located the epicenter at A, which was taken as the starting point of the Nair electrometer measurements. The intensity at this point was 39.6 J, and measurements were successively made at points alphabetically indicated. By these measurements, the epicenter was fixed at point M, the intensity being 44.8 J. The center determined from the shadow on scorched surfaces lies at point N. How then were the effects of neutrons extended into the ground? To answer this question, a square hole two by two meters was dug at the epicenter. Measurements of the radioactive intensities were made at various depths, up to one meter, but no more as subterranean water prevented measurements beyond that depth. Results showed that intensity dropped severely to a depth of 30 centimeters and then eased off.
In the Nishiyama district, about three kilometers from the epicenter, rain and ashes fell at the time of the detonation. Measurements were made in the same manner here as in the corresponding district of Takasu in Hiroshima. This is the result of measurements made with the Lauritsen electroscope. Radiation as strong as 260 times the natural leak was found here, indicating that ashes with far stronger radiation fell here as compared with Takasu in Hiroshima, where the radiation was only five times the natural leak. Radioactivity at Nishiyama decayed with time. Curve A was obtained by successive measurements at different times. The half value period was 44 days. Curve B indicates radioactivity in the ground at the epicenter. Radiation at the epicenter was caused by direct bombardment by neutrons at Nishiyama by fission products. This may explain the difference, but the question is yet to be clarified. Radioactivity of the Earth was measured with samples taken from a roof, shown by curve C, and from a sheet iron, shown by curve D. Although a definite explanation of the difference is difficult, a probable reason is that the Earth taken from the roof was washed by rain and lost its original composition. We know that the radioactivity at Nishiyama was due to the fission products of the atomic bomb which were brought down to the ground by rain. It is an interesting question how far such radioactive active dust extends over the Shimabara Peninsula. To answer this question, the intensities of radiation emitted by, by the ground were measured all over the peninsula with the Nair electrometer. To the northwest at Tokitsu, the value was 4.8 J. To the south at Mogimachi, the value was 4.9 J. Since all these values were about the same as the natural leak of our near electrometer, we concluded that radioactive dust did not fall either to the north or to the south of the epicenter. Because the west wind prevailed in this district at the time of the detonation, we extended our observations toward the east and found that radioactivity extended all over the Shimabara Peninsula. Starting from Nishiyama, we proceeded toward the east to Unzen, and as far as Shimabara, and then encircled the entire peninsula. From the results, we saw that the strongest radioactive point was at Nishiyama, that on proceeding eastward, the intensity gradually decreased at first and then increased again showing a second maximum of 55.4 J at the Agani, nine kilometers from the epicenter. The intensity then decreased again as we went eastward until we came to Shimabara, 47 kilometers from the epicenter, where we found the third maximum of 16.4 J. From these results, we concluded that the radioactive dust of the atomic bomb was blown high up in the air and then drifted with the then prevailing west wind toward the east. Some of the dust fell on the ground on the way. From our measurements, we surmise that the dust crossed the Ariake Sea and that radioactivity can probably be found even in the Kumamoto area. Effects on the human body observed here in Nagasaki were similar to those observed in Hiroshima. First aid work was carried on in the large buildings which escaped destruction, and at hospitals in neighboring towns and villages. This is the condition we found at the Shinkozen public school, where treatments were continued over the longest period. More than 3,000 patients were treated here. Later, patients were asked where they were at the time of the atomic explosion and whatever else they remembered. Blood corpuscle tests were also made. 
and medical observations and studies were carried on simultaneously with the treatments. Many patients were brought for treatments from the outside, from houses which escaped destruction. This is a case of burns. This is a case of burns on the hands and face. And here is a case of laceration caused by flying glass fragments. The serious cases in homeless patients were accommodated in the schoolrooms, which were used as wards. Burns on the right thigh. Burns on the feet. A girl ten years old who was 400 meters from the epicenter. She shows symptoms of anemia, leukocyte 1600. Four fingers of her left hand are about to fall off on account of severe burns. Like her sister, she is losing her hair as a result of radiation. This woman also shows anemia and depredation caused by radiation. This 15-year-old girl has lost practically all her hair. This little girl of four was 500 meters from the epicenter. For about 14 days, she was as lively as she could be but gradually she lost vitality and got edema. A case of hemorrhage caused by a fracture of the bones and anemia. This boy of 11 was 2,000 meters from the epicenter. Leukocyte 5,900. Depuration, extreme anemia, and asthenia. And this young man of 18 suffers from burns and anemia and shows serious symptoms. This boy of six lost his resistance power and developed Noma. He died three days after this photograph was taken.
The city of Nagasaki is narrow and extends from north to south. The hills flanking both sides of the city are, for the most part, farmland. Because the epicenter was not in the center of the city, but in the outskirts to the north, where buildings were comparatively few, the effects of fire were insignificant, affording a convenient opportunity to study the effects of penetrating rays. According to an American announcement, the bomb used on Nagasaki was more powerful than the one used on Hiroshima. The first impression we received at Nagasaki is that near the epicenter, almost every variety of vegetation showed abnormalities. In Hiroshima, abnormal plants were found in an area within one kilometer or so from the epicenter. In Nagasaki, however, the range was greater, extending to one and a half kilometers. We shall now see a few examples of abnormal plants. At the foot of the hills at Shiroyamamachi, about one kilometer from the epicenter, we found a field of taro. When the atomic bomb hit Nagasaki, the entire surface of the taro field was burnt out. In all the leaves which sprouted since then, greenish-yellow patterns appeared. The morning glory. The shape of the leaves has changed, and there is a diminished amount of chlorophyll. The sunflower. In this group of sunflowers, the leaves were shriveled and showed peculiar white patches caused by penetrating rays. The castor bean plant. Like those seen in Hiroshima, the shape has changed and the leaves are shriveled. Ebisagusaoro senna. As in Hiroshima, the leaves show white patches. Murasaki katabami, or violet wood sorrel. White dots and shriveled leaves. Masaki, a plant of the stuff tree family. These patches are often found under normal conditions, but these are believed to have been caused by penetrating rays. Note the white patches between the stem and the leaf. Kakidoshi, of the mint family, another example of white patches. They are often found under natural conditions too, and sweet potato leaves with patches. The sedge. There are leaves with white lines and those which have entirely turned white. Parts where active cell division is taking place are generally most easily affected by penetrating rays. By this illustration, we can see the position of the tip of the subterranean stem, which was exposed to penetrating radiation. First, with regard to trees. In the epicenter area, trees were completely burned by powerful heat. As the blast came directly from overhead, the trees did not fall but remained standing erect. In the hills behind the medical college, some 800 meters from the epicenter, trees which lost their leaves were beginning to sprout new ones, but only on the side not facing the epicenter. Shiroyamamachi, about 1,100 meters from the epicenter. Here, new leaves were sprouting even on the side facing the epicenter. In this vicinity, we discovered the Aogiri tree, Sultan's parasol, whose side facing the epicenter was completely burned.
The epicenter is around there. On the banks of the stream below the Uragami Cathedral, 600 meters east of the epicenter, we found the Higanbana, a plant of the Amaryllis family. The stems we saw were exceedingly short, averaging only six centimeters. But as we proceeded upstream and farther away from the epicenter, we found the stems increasingly longer. At point B, one kilometer from the epicenter, the stems averaged 21 centimeters. At point C, 500 meters further beyond, we found the stems having the normal length of 46 centimeters on the average. Rice fields closest to the epicenter were immediately below the cathedral. The rice plants were completely burnt. Only stumps were left. About 100 meters further, rice plants grew only sparsely but somehow managed to grow and bear grains. Another 800 meters further beyond, or one kilometer from the epicenter, the growth appeared to be quite normal. But even this area was completely burned when the atomic bomb fell. If you comb the stalks, burnt leaves can be found among them. Near the prison, close to the epicenter, this sweet potato field is completely burned. But if you dig into the ground, you can find the sweet potatoes still alive, but their size remains the same as at the time of the atomic bombing. The entire hill behind the cathedral, 700 meters from the epicenter, is covered with sweet potato fields. Feebly looking stems were beginning to shoot out in this vicinity. If you dig, you would find that stems which existed at the time of the atomic explosion were completely burnt and that new stems are growing out of the potatoes themselves. There were also many deformed leaves and stems around here. To add a few remarks, in the sweet potato fields in the rear of the cathedral, various studies were possible as to the effects of penetrating radiation on sweet potatoes. Due to the fact that there are slopes of varying degrees facing the detonation center, the amount of radiation received by plants varied greatly. We found accordingly various kinds of potatoes, those which do not even have buds to those which grow normally. The farther removed the sweet potato fields are from the epicenter, the better is their state of recovery. In the hills behind the medical college, about one kilometer from the epicenter, the sweet potato stems were dried up by heat, but those hidden in the ground were alive, and new stems have sprouted from them. The crop was comparatively good.
Mr. Furuno, chief of the agricultural section of the Nagasaki prefectural government at the time, lost his wife and daughter when his house located 300 meters from the epicenter was wiped out by the explosion. Determined to stay where his house had stood, he planted buckwheat in his yard on August 13, only four days after the disaster. The buckwheat is growing without showing the least sign of abnormality. Since then, Fruno has planted wakegi, a kind of onion, and this too is growing normally. Experimental gardens were started in various places in Nagasaki by the Faculty of Agriculture of the Kyushu Imperial University to study the effect of radioactivity produced by the bomb on the growth of rapeseed, Japanese white radish, barley, buckwheat, broad beans, and other plants. Every one of them is growing well, as if no atomic bomb had ever fallen in the vicinity. of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. For a moment, tragic scenes of devastation have begun to recover with the passage of time. Slowly but surely, efforts toward construction are being made. Insufficient though the studies of the scientists may have been, they have given hope and light to these cities and their citizens. The day may come when atomic energy, used for the first time in the world for strategic military purposes, will be utilized toward the ends of peace and the happiness of all mankind. So is it desired, so is it hoped, and so is it believed.